Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 301. Today, we're going to talk about starting your own martial arts school. I'm going to give you my thoughts on how you can do that. All the options, the ups, the downs, pros, the cons. So let's hang on for that. But first, a couple things I want to let you know about. Don't forget, you can head on over to WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. I'm hoping... Some of you out there that have comments, feedback, we'll leave those over on that website, on the show notes page. I'm also hoping that you might check out whistlekick.com. It's where we sell all of our sparring gear, all our apparel, all the new things that we're bringing in and bringing on all the time. Some really fun stuff. So check that out. Sign up for the newsletter while you're there because we are sending that out every other week. You're going to get some discounts, some news info on new products really it's just kind of the condensed the reader's digest version if you will of everything that's happening with whistlekick let's talk about starting your own martial arts school now some of you that have been listening for a while know i talk about it once in a while i did have my own karate school for a couple years after college it was a lot of fun i learned a ton it's also a lot of work and wasn't the most financially beneficial thing that I've done in my life. And we've heard from a number of guests, both the upsides and the downsides of having a martial arts school, of being a martial arts instructor, whether that's full-time or part-time. There are a lot of things that you want to think about. So this episode is really for the folks who have not started a martial arts school. Maybe you're considering it. Maybe it's down the line. Maybe it's a dream of yours. But for the folks who are listening who have a martial arts school, I would love for you to listen because I want to know what I've missed. There are always things that I'm going to miss. This is my set of opinions and thoughts and experiences. And it's lacking because it's not everybody. Together, we're all better than any of us are individually. So that's why I'm asking for everyone listening to contribute to the conversation at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. Thank you. All right, let's jump into this. Now, there are, of course, a lot of ways you can start your career as a martial arts instructor. But we're going to start with the pros and cons of why you should even do that. Before we get into how to do that, why should you do that? Now, on the plus side, you get to own your own business. As a multi-time entrepreneur, I think that's a wonderful thing. It's not for everyone, but owning a martial arts school is, I don't want to say a safer way, but a less intense way of becoming a business owner as compared to with many, many of the other options out there. Of course, you get to do something that you're passionate about, teaching martial arts. And if you've spent any time teaching people, you know that it furthers your own understanding, your own comprehension of martial arts. You get to become a better martial artist by teaching others. And of course, you get to pass on your knowledge. But then on the downside... You own your own business. A friend of mine put it best once. He said, I love being a business owner. I get to have complete control and I only have to work half days. And I even get to pick which 12 hours I work. Now, maybe as a martial arts school owner, you're not going to work 12 hours, especially if you're part time. But that idea still holds true. It's still a lot of work. It's still a job. If owning a business, any kind of business were easy, that's the path everyone would choose. There's a risk reward in owning a business and you have to decide how much risk you're willing to put in for whatever you value of the potential rewards. Because remember, nothing is guaranteed. Now, the hard work of owning a martial arts school can make your own training difficult. I often hear from school owners that they don't work on their own training as much anymore. They can't because at the end of the day, they're tired. They have other commitments They need sleep. And of course, as much as this may not resonate for some of you, a number of you are going to nod your heads. By adding teaching into your life, you risk being oversaturated with martial arts. Now you're training, you're teaching, maybe you're traveling to events. If you have a competitive team at your school, a good number of your weekends may be taken up. It's a lot. It can be difficult to make your life outside of martial arts when you are a martial arts school owner. I know quite a few people who have martial arts schools and 
most of them have just jumped in with both feet at one point or another. And martial arts is their life the majority of the time. And that's not for everyone. And of course, if you are a martial arts school owner, you have to play the political game. There is stuff that matters. Considering where to open your school or schools, where are you teaching? Who are you teaching? How are you teaching? What does your instructor think? What are your fellow martial artists in the area think? There's so much to worry about. And that could probably be an episode in and of itself, but it's not going to be, at least not right now. Now, we're going to move on to talk about the how. We're going to go through, how many do I have here? Six different ways that you can consider teaching your own martial arts program. Now, of course, you could teach for yourself or you could teach for someone else. There are even martial arts franchises that you can buy into. Now, I'm not going to recommend or discourage any of them because I don't know them from the inside. In fact, I've never participated in a school that was one of those. I will let you decide, based on the information I give you, how you might want to proceed. Of course, you can always reach out. You can you can email me with questions, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I can't promise I'm going to write back to all of those emails in perpetuity. I expect this might be an episode that people listen to long into the future. But of course, you know, I'll, I'll do my best as I always have. The first of the six ways I have down on my list, of course, it's the one that most martial arts school owners start with. And I would venture to say most martial arts programs, at least in the United States, are in this kind of a format. The instructor is teaching part-time in some kind of a shared space, meaning they're, you know, using a community center gymnasium or something similar. Now the pros, this is the easiest way to start out. You've got the lowest expenses. You likely need some insurance. You need to pay for the space. And then from there, all, all you have to do, quote unquote, all is growing the program. You can focus on your marketing. You can focus on elevating this program with whatever time you have. If you don't have a lot of time, your program might just spread through word of mouth, or maybe you want to be a little more aggressive with it. Maybe you have the time and you're going to travel and introduce yourself to people in the area. You're going to teach at community events and teach self-defense programs and, and just otherwise build your reputation. These are all great things. And finally, the one that I think a lot of people don't talk about enough the financial piece. You get to keep your day job. For a lot of people I know who teach part-time in a shared space, all the money is gravy to them. You know, that once the taxes come out, and of course, I'm not going to discourage anyone to not pay taxes on this money, whether or not you feel you have to, that is your decision. And you should probably consult an accountant or other tax professional. That's extra money. It's a part-time job. And it's a part-time job that, in theory, you love. Now the cons. It's hard to have enough time and energy to grow a program in this way. The reason that there are so many of these programs is because they're easy to start up. But I don't see a lot of people that start programs in this way and then have them grow into something more. I rarely see someone that is teaching part-time in a shared space become a full-time martial arts instructor. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen. If you've done it, that's great. I want to hear from you. I want to hear how you've done it. But because of the commitments of day-to-day -day life, because of the effort you have to put into your day job or maybe your family or whatever other obligations and hobbies you have, there's not a lot left for your martial arts program. And this was the challenge I had. I was building my last business, an IT company. And at the end of the day, I didn't have enough left. There was not enough Jeremy to go around. And so after a couple years, I shut the program down. I was really sad to do it. But it was the right thing to do for me, for my students, because I was exhausted. I was spent. And honestly, my teaching was starting to show it. From a marketing perspective, these programs don't always have the most professional image. When you consider prospective students, if they're evaluating multiple schools, if they have the option of a full-time school in a mall or something with a, a, a beautiful space all built out just for martial arts, that compared to what you're doing in a school gymnasium or a church basement, well, it's kind of hard to compete solely on the appearance. You have to do other things to make sure that your program can stand on its own 
against those. And you can do it. There's plenty of ways to do it. I know plenty of people who do it. Of course, your next option, you can stay part-time, but you can control the space. You can rent a space or maybe own the space. Maybe it's a large finished garage on your property, or maybe you have a great opportunity to sublet a dedicated space from somebody else or, or, or something. You know, there's some something where when you are not teaching martial arts in that space, it is not being used for something else. Of course, that gives you a lot of upside. You have more control. It's easier to grow the program because you don't have to spend time, you know, bringing mats onto the floor or putting them away. You can still keep your day job, but you get a little bit more focus because when you're in the space, it is a martial arts space. It is only a martial arts space. And not only is that going to have an impact on you and the way you approach the space, but also your students, also anybody that visits that may want to join your program. The cons, there are, it's an even greater expense than when you're sharing a space. And of course, there's more time in managing that space, cleaning the bathrooms, little stuff like that, that we don't tend to consider. It adds up. It's actually pretty considerable if you want to have a nice space, cleaning the mats, cleaning the floor, washing the windows, whatever that stuff is, it adds up. And this is why in a lot of schools, there are days where, you know, students might come together and help clean the training space. The third way, you can go full time, but you can be in a shared space. Now, this doesn't happen often. It's even unlikely, but I've seen some fitness centers that have an excess of space and they're willing to let people teach, you know, 20, 30, 40 hours a week out of those spaces. And sometimes the financial arrangement is a flat fee. Sometimes it's a per student fee. Uh, sometimes, you know, you can outsource the, the management of the financial piece to, to the space. I mean, there, there's some, some upside there, but it's, it's generally hard to find a space that is going to work in that way. Usually this becomes more of an employee relationship and that's actually number five we'll get to in a moment. The upside though, to being full-time in a shared space is when you factor in your expenses per student, your expenses per dollar. They're the lowest. They're, they're generally quite low. And of course, you're all in. It allows you to forget about the distractions of a full-time job or another job. Maybe you have a part-time job, but it gives you more time, more space in your mind to focus on growing the program. You don't have as much in the way that's distracting you. And of course, you have little to worry about with regard to the space. You don't have to focus on cleaning the bathroom or any of that. So again, it gives you the option to focus on your marketing, on growing the program. The downside, it's still kind of hard to seem professional. In fact, if someone says, hey, wait, you're full time, but you don't have your own space, why? Let's face it, people assume that if you're successful, you have your own space. Whether that's your own home in life or your own car in life, we are still at a point in time where even though we're on the, the front end of this kind of shared economy, you know, Uber and Lyft, and there are even services now to rent tools or planes. I mean, there's a lot there for this kind of crowdsourced product sharing economy thing that we're on, the again, the front edge of. There's still a perception that if you are renting or rather sharing a space, you are less successful. So you need to consider that. The one that I hear people talk about the least until they're into it, and it's actually something I haven't mentioned before and actually should have mentioned in the in the first option with the shared space, you don't get full control over that space. You might get kicked out because the building wants to refinish the floor or they're having a performance or um, you know somebody forgot to unlock the doors. You know, There's some challenge there, and it's something that needs to be considered because even though it's not your fault that classes don't run because the floor is getting refinished your students still aren't happy they're paying for that time and they don't get to train and who does that roll down to because you know what rolls downhill you now going full time this is number four in an owned or a rented space this is the most professional it gives you the most flexibility you can do whatever you want especially if you own the space you get to focus on your martial arts program, on your students, on growing the school. 
And that has a lot of upside, but it's got some downside too. Especially if you don't have a program yet, you're going zero to 60. You're biting off everything at once. If you don't have experience with this, you're learning how to manage a space and deal with the marketing and teach the program. And it's, it's everything. It's everything all at once. There are systems out there that will help you do this, you know, monthly fees, people who are experienced with helping you grow your martial arts school. And if you are going to jump in with this number four, with going full time in your own dedicated space, that probably means that you've got a bit of financial cushion there. At least up front, you're, I'm going to suggest that you look to someone else that has done this, whether that's a friend in the area or one of these management companies. It's probably a good idea because you don't know what you don't know. And if, remember, if this stuff was easy, everybody would be doing it. This really is the most expensive option because you don't have your day job. You have all the expense of the space and you're probably going to need help in some way. If you're teaching a full-time program, most full-time programs I know people are teaching five days a week and they're teaching generally some morning classes, maybe some classes at lunch and then a whole bunch of classes in the evenings. Well, you're probably going to need some help, whether that's cleaning the space or plowing the driveway if you're in the north, or maybe help from some others teaching the classes, there's, there's even more money going out for that. And you're most likely to have a lease. If you don't own the space, you've got a lease. And commercial leases, they're not generally for 12 months. They're three to five. Which means if you outgrow the space, moving becomes a challenge. Or if you look at downsizing the program or just changing it in some way you're likely committed. You can't just kind of change on a dime as you do with smaller programs, especially in generally shared spaces like a community center where you're paying, you know, a fee. Number five, I know several people who run martial arts programs as an employee of an organization, like a Boys and Girls Club or a YMCA. And that can be really synergistic. That actually, for the people that I know doing that, it seems to be incredibly rewarding. I don't know that I want to say the most rewarding, but it seems pretty good. Look at the upside. You might be able to be part-time or full-time. You can even possibly grow as the program grows. You get lots of the marketing taken care of for, for you. You know, a lot of these programs, they're publishing lists, calendars. They have a captive audience with people coming in to use the space for other purposes. They have email marketing already. They have, you know, they're sending out schedules. There's a lot done there. And if you're an employee, you may have a guaranteed income. Maybe it's per student, or maybe they're paying you an hourly fee. This is where I want to take a step out and encourage you to decide what is most important. Why are you doing this? If the money is not important to you, as I know plenty of martial arts instructors who don't really care about making money. They just don't want to lose money. This is a great option. You can partner up with an organization that does the things that you don't want to do. If you just want to teach, look for somebody who is willing to put in the marketing time to reap the financial benefit. You can get in on their insurance. There's one less expense for you. And you know what? If you're sick, maybe they've got somebody who can cover for you. Maybe you've cultivated someone. There's something to be said for doing something as an employee versus an owner. It's a mindset and it can be a lot more fun. I'm not going to lie. As with everything, there are downsides though. You're limited in what you can do because you're going to have to answer to someone else. If, you know, half a dozen parents call up and complain to your boss that you didn't do something that they liked or, or did something they didn't like, well, guess what? You're probably going to get called in. You're probably going to get scolded. You could even get fired because you don't own the program. You probably can't take it elsewhere. And of course, the organization's problems are your problems, whether or not you're an employee. If the billing system on the back end continually double charges people or, or there are issues with that, guess who they're going to be unhappy with? You. You're the representative of the organization. So the downside here is that there is a disconnect between your authority 
because you're an employee, and your responsibility. Well, you're the face of the program. And the majority of problems that I've seen in business come from either poor communication or a disconnect between authority and responsibility. And then the last one I'll give you, number six, you could buy an existing school. On the plus side, it's already established. There are processes, there are students, there's cash flow. It's a school in a box. You have to step in and make sure that you don't blow it up. But on the downside, you're buying something that's already established. It can be difficult to change things, especially for people that have been training there for a while. You have the greatest upfront expense. You are either taking out a loan or putting down a big chunk of money to buy in on this school. And while that can reap some financial rewards later, upfront expense is certainly something that needs to be considered. And this is the one, number six is the one, where you're going to have to spend the most time deciding and doing research and and talking to experts. And that leads to how should you start any of this? Once you have an idea of, of what options are or aren't for you, and maybe you don't have it narrowed down to just one, or maybe you think you do, but this next piece might change your mind. You want to start by taking a look at your financial situation and understanding your own tolerance for risk. I know people who will never start a martial arts school, even though they would love to, because they can't wrap their brain around the idea of not having a fixed paycheck. But I know plenty of other people who will jump into nearly anything with both feet because their tolerance for risk is much greater. Of course, you should talk to friends who have started successful businesses, not just martial arts businesses. But I want to caution you that all advice is not equal. I've said it on the show, I say it in life quite a bit. I don't take diet advice from overweight people. I don't take money advice from people who are broke. I don't take business advice from people who've never started a successful business. And I'm going to discourage you from doing it. Sometimes people who have failed a lot and never succeeded do have some great advice on what not to do. But if you're looking for what to do, you kind of have to look to someone who's had some success with doing it. You should have a plan. You should put together some projections of what you need financially, what you need for a timeline. What would you need to do for marketing? What marketing works in your area? This is where I'm going to put in a plug for the Small Business Development Center, which is a government organization. They exist in every state in the United States, and I suspect for our international folks, there are things that are similar. And the Small Business Development Center, the SBDC, is an organization dedicated to helping people get started and run with small businesses. Full disclosure, I am on the board of directors for the Vermont SBDC. It's a great organization. Honestly, I wouldn't have gotten my first business off the ground without the SBDC. And that's why now I give back and I spend that time helping the organization. There's a chapter near you. There are people near you. Uh, There are also... Other organizations, similar, SCORE, those are uh, retired, generally retired uh, professionals who have, you know, have some experience to lend. You know, it's all about helping people. It's all about people helping you understand the stuff you don't know that you don't know. That's why I, I advocate for people working with experts. I already mentioned set a timeline. How far out are you for this? You know, if you're going to start your own program full time, Well, maybe you have to build up enough money that it's going to take you three years to do that. If you're going to start part-time in a shared space, maybe you can start next week. It's all about how motivated you are and how honest you're going to be with yourself about the risks and what risks you're willing to take on. And of course, the final thing you have to do is you have to do it. I know so many people who have said, I'm going to do this, and they never pull the trigger. They're never quite there. There's always one more thing. There's a quote, and I I might not get the words exactly, but there's a quote from the the gentleman who started LinkedIn. His name's Reid Hoffman. And Reid Hoffman says that if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've waited too long. Now, of course, he was talking about a website, but the same thing can hold true when we're starting any kind of a business, a service business, like a martial arts school. 
if you are trying to make everything perfect, if you need the perfect website and the perfect posters and the perfect space, and you have to be full-time doing it, and you have to have the perfect logo that's embroidered on your martial arts uniform, and you need the t-shirt design, and you need to bring in, you know, a pro shop and yada, 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 you're never going to start. Quite often, I would even say the majority of the time, people that focus on building these perfect 1.0 businesses perfect when it starts they're actually scared they're not willing to jump in with both feet they're not even willing to jump in with one foot because if you never start you'll never fail and i look at it the other way if you never start you'll never succeed so for those of you listening i want your feedback i want you to head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com let's get some discussion going let's turn the notes for this episode into a resource for other people of course this will be transcribed a little bit after release, as with all the new episodes, and we even go back and we're doing the older ones. But this is a wonderful opportunity for us to help each other. Because remember, the world is better with more martial artists in it. What did you do to start your martial arts teaching, if you have a school? What do you wish you knew before you had started teaching? If you're looking to start, what questions do you have? What do you need? Hit the show notes, comment over there. For those of you that have made purchases recently at whistlekick.com, thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. We're seeing greater sales. Some of it's because of the, the fun new apparel we've got going on. Some of it's because we're constantly expanding the products, you know, the, the protective gear that we've got, adding colors, sizes. We're getting better about inventory. You know, we're able to buy more as we grow. And sign up for the newsletter. So that's all I've got for today. This was a long Thursday show. Thanks for bearing with me. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'd love your feedback. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>